In this lesson, we will be looking at chapter 14.1 through 14.6. We will begin investigating population ecology, specifically patterns of population distribution and growth. Ecology itself is the study of interactions among organisms and among organisms in their environment. During our unit on ecology, we will be looking at both biotic interactions, the interactions between living organisms, and abiotic interactions, which are the interactions between living organisms and the non-living areas around them. If you guys find this stuff interesting as we go, and you need another science credit here at Wake Tech, I strongly suggest you take Environmental Science, which is Bio 140. Bio 140 is a lot of application of the information that we will look at in this unit. Ecology itself is broken down into different scales, such as an organism, population, community, ecosystem, or the biosphere. An organism is one single individual that we can study in their environment. A population, which we've defined before, is a group of organisms of the same species living in the same area that generally can reproduce together. A community is going to be a larger scale where we look at multiple populations and how they interact together. An ecosystem takes our community, all of the living organisms in an area, and it adds in the abiotic factors such as weather, nutrient and energy cycling, and water cycles. The largest scale of ecology is looking at the biosphere where we investigate global patterns. Organismal ecology often studies an organism's structures, physiology, and behaviors and how those help the animal or organism meet the environmental challenges it must face. Population ecology studies factors that affect the population's growth, density, and size over time. We can look at distributions, how the animals or organisms are spread out in their environment, as well as intraspecific interactions those between individuals of the population. Community ecology studies interspecific interactions, which are interactions between the different populations. We can look at things like disturbances, richness and density, and succession of our community. Ecosystems study energy flow, nutrient cycling, and trophic interactions. This takes into account abiotic factors such as nutrients or energy flow as well as interactions with the living organisms. The biosphere refers to our entire globe. We will see global patterns and their effect on the lower levels of ecology, such as ecosystems and communities. Here's a review question. When we are thinking about how many lobsters live off of the coast of New England, we may be analyzing Correct. A population. We are looking at how many lobsters there are in one area. Ecology usually requires a population perspective or higher. Most e ecological processes cannot be observed with just an individual. Again, we are studying interactions, so it's hard to study all of the interactions without looking at a whole population, a whole community, or a whole ecosystem. We're going to start with populations. To describe populations, we generally take snapshots of what's going on right then and there. Populations are dynamic. They're constantly changing as organisms come and go, live and die. We can describe our population in three major ways. In the distribution, or how those organisms are spread out. The density, how many there are per unit of area. And in growth. So how quickly is the population increasing, decreasing, or is the population stable? Population density refers to the number of individuals per unit area or volume. Distribution refers to the pattern of spacing among the individuals within the boundaries of the population. Both the density and the distribution relies on resource availability. So what is a resource? Resources are the things organisms need to survive. This can be food or water. It can also be space, habitat, 
It can be nutrients or mates. Any substance or interaction that a organism requires to survive and thrive can be considered a resource. Distribution is dependent on the availability of resources. We're going to look at three distribution patterns, clumped, random, and uniform. Clumped distribution or dispersion is when individuals group together in patches. Clumped distribution is usually influenced by resources, availability, or sometimes by behavior. We see that in these examples with the trees, Water is a scarce commodity in the desert, so when water surfaces, organisms clump around that resource. In this one over here, we see many sea stars clumping together around the mollusks, which are their food source. So again, they are clumping around the resource that they need to survive. Uniform distribution is when individuals are equally spaced in their environment. This may be influenced by social interactions such as territoriality or the resources may be limited, preventing them from being any closer to one another. Two good examples are in forests and seabirds. In the forest, we see that these trees are evenly spaced. This is due to resource availability. Each tree needs a certain area of space below or in the ground for its roots to grow. Without that space, it will not get enough nutrients and the tree will die. So these trees are equally spaced to ensure that each one gets all the resources they need. Territoriality sometimes comes into play as well. These seabirds are territorial over their nest. These birds are spaced evenly because of their nesting patterns. Each nest is just far enough away from their neighbors that the bird cannot touch or peck at its neighbor as long as it's sitting on its own nest. So this territoriality causes these birds to evenly space themselves when they are nesting. The third pattern of distribution we're going to look at is random dispersion or random distribution. This is when the position of each individual is independent of the other individuals in the population. Random spacing occurs in the absence of strong attractions or repulsions. This means there's no territoriality. And also we see that the limit, uh, resources are not limited. This means there's plenty of resources for everyone. So in the case of these plants, wherever the seeds land, they will grow because resources are plentiful. We see the same thing with these flowers in the field. Because there are plentiful resources and the plants are not territorial, we see they can grow anywhere and are randomly spaced. This is an easy math problem. 520 individual birds divided by 2 acres. This gives us 260 birds per acre. Humans like to figure out population density, particularly for our own population. So for example, you can look up the population density by state. Florida has a population density of approximately 353 people per square mile. North Carolina has a population density of 189 people per square mile. Last I checked, New Jersey was the most dense state with 1,170 people per square mile. Remember, for population densities to be so high, there have to be high resources allowing for that many people or that many organisms to be in one area. If the resources are limited and there are a few things, individuals must spread out to get what they need. There are some exceptions to the population density rule. For example, we often see herds of animals traveling together. This is because there are safety in numbers. So zebra herds, for example, live in high numbers where the density is too high to be supported by the resources in one area. They live together because they are safer together than they are by themselves. It's harder for a lion or other predator to pick them off if they are in a big group compared to if they are all by themselves. 
So how do large herds survive if they outnumber the available resources? This is why herds of zebras and other large herbivores migrate across the savanna. They move from place to place to increase their resource availability. The next topic we're going to investigate is population growth. Populations can grow quickly over time for a while, but not forever. Population growth also has to do with population size. Population size is influenced by birth and death rates, as well as immigration, or the influx of new individuals from other areas, and emigration, which is the movement of individuals out of a population. Here's an example of a population of sparrows. Each year, there are a certain number of babies born into our population. We also see that some birds immigrate into our population. On the flip side, there are some sparrows that die each year, either due to natural causes, predation, or other problems. And there are also birds that emigrate out of our population and move to other areas. All of these factors will contribute to the overall population size and the population growth rate. The population growth rate equals the number of births in the population minus the number of deaths in the population each year. Generally, immigration and emigration are so small that we kind of neglect or ignore those two factors. We can also say that the assumption is that immigration equals emigration, so that overall change would be zero. Population growth rates lead us to two major growth trends. We can look at the exponential model and the logistical model of growth. Exponential growth occurs when individuals produce more offspring than it's necessary to replace itself and its mate. Generally, this can occur for a time and populations will increase rapidly, creating a J-like shape to the population growth chart. Here's an example of exponential growth. We see that the population starts low and it raises very rapidly in a J-shaped curve. Exponential growth, though, cannot be supported for long periods of time. Generally, there are resource limitations that keep the population from increasing forever. There are times when we see exponential growth in nature, at least for a short period. One example is rebounding populations. This elephant population in South Africa grew exponentially after hunting was banned in that area. Introduced species or invasive species will also increase exponentially, at least for a time. A good example of this was rabbits when they were introduced into a new population. They bred rapidly and their population skyrocketed at an exponential rate. As we mentioned before, exponential growth cannot continue forever. This leads us to our second model of growth, the logistic growth model. Logistic growth describes population growth that is gradually reduced as the population nears the environment's carrying capacity. The carrying capacity is the number of organisms that the environment can support long term. We see here that in the logistic growth model, the carrying capacity, abbreviated as K, is where the population levels off and is no longer increasing. There are many factors in the environment that can limit population growth. This includes resource availability, such as food, water, shelter, space, mates. Even natural disasters can limit populations. So storms, floods, fires, all of these can stop populations from growing and decrease them slowly over time or rapidly. Some of these factors are density dependent, meaning that the more individuals there are, the bigger the effect of that limiting factor. Other factors are density independent and it does not matter how many individuals there are in the population, all individuals present will be affected by that factor. All limiting factors affect a population's growth. This is also playing into population density. The more dense a population tells us that there are more resources available and that the carrying capacity is higher in that environment. 
Density-dependent factors include things like food supply, habitat for living and breeding, parasites and diseases, and predation risk. Again, all of these are affected by how many organisms there are in the population or how dense the population is. As the population becomes more dense, food becomes more scarce, space is limited, the risk of parasites and disease goes up because you're in close contact with your neighbors and can easily spread these things, and predation risk goes up because it's easier for a predator to catch a prey item if they are densely packed together. Density independent forces or factors are ones that strike populations without regard of the size of the population. Generally, these are weather-based or human-inflicted disasters, things such as fires, storms, floods, or humans destroying a habitat can all be density independent factors. Density independent factors limit population size by drastically decreasing the population very rapidly. This then allows the population to recover over time. Some of these independent factors actually occur on a regular basis. So certain ecosystems have a um, flood or fire at fairly regular intervals, which again limits the population overall and prevents them from overtaking the other resources in the area. We also see that certain populations cycle between large and small population size. Sometimes these oscillations are caused by interactions with other groups. A classic example is predator-prey interactions between snowshoe hares and lynx. We can see that as the hare population increases, this provides more food for the lynx. With time, the lynx will also start to increase. However, as lynx increase, they eat all of the hares, causing the hare population to crash or decrease rapidly. After that, the lynx population runs out of food and their resources are limited. Therefore, their population also decreases. Because the lynx population has decreased, the predation risk has gone down as well. This allows the hare population to jump back up and start to increase again. When the hare population increases, the food supply for the lynx increases, which allows the lynx population to increase as well. We see this continuing cycle of increase-decrease, increase-decrease of both the predators and the prey over time. Here's a practice problem. Why is the lynx population decreasing at the point labeled number 2 on this graph? The correct answer is number 4, so both 1 and 3 are correct. Remember, food supply is a density-dependent factor, and for these lynx, the hares are their food. So because the hare population has decreased, the lynx are running out of food, which limits their population and causes them to decrease as well. In summary, this lesson has looked at the scope of ecology, and we looked at the beginnings of population ecology factors such as population growth, population density, and population distributions. Be sure to look over the learning objectives posted in Blackboard to help you study for this lesson.